This UCSD TV program is a presentation of University of California Television for educational and non commercial use only. I'm pleased to announce my co-chair, Dr. Ajit Varki, who's the uh, CARTA co-director and is a faculty member at UCSD uh, to talk about human-specific changes in SIGLEC genes. Thank you, Elaine. So I'd like to give you an overview of some work we've been doing in the last couple of decades, which has culminated in looking at one specific area of uh, biology in relation to genes, and this is human-specific changes in SIGLEC genes. But in order to put this in perspective, I'm going to really give you a rather broad overview of the system I'm studying, and then really not going to give you a lot of details. In some slides, I'll have some, some details which are for the aficionados, but if you just look at the titles of each slide, they basically summarize what the slide shows. So all cells in nature are covered with a dense coating of sugar chains or glycans. This would be an electron micrograph of a human lymphocyte. And you can see that this thick layer of sugar chains is coating all cell surfaces. This is true of every cell in your body. Now, if we were to zoom in there, we now know the structure of a lot of these different types of sugar chains. And what we find is that sialic acids decorate most cell surface and secreted molecules of all vertebrate cells sitting out on the tips here. So what do sialic acids do? They've been around in the since the deuterostome lineage of animals emerged in the Cambrian expansion, and they have many biological roles ranging from neuroplasticity to glomerular filtration to a variety of other physical roles. Given their location, they're also the obvious target for every pathogen that approaches us. So influenza, malaria, cholera, et cetera, the list would go off the screen if I completed it. If that were the sole purpose of sialic acids, you would not have kept them for 500 million years. And if you take out sialic acids in a mouse, you have early embryonic lethal. And this may be because we and others have found a variety of receptors required to re recognize sialic acid that are intrinsic to the system. The situation gets complicated because a wide variety of very successful pathogens come in coated with sialic acid, sort of a Klingon coating device to look like us, and are very successful in invading us. So if you look across the bottom of the screen, you can imagine 500 million years of an evolutionary arms race. If you have sialic acids, you're probably going to die. If you don't have sialic acids, you are going to die. <laughs> so uh, sialic acids, therefore, have been rapidly evolving. And we have uh, got recent data suggesting that in this system, of course, this is recognition of non-self. The pathogens are recognizing us, so we are recognizing the pathogens. But that the sialic acid is also involved in intrinsic recognition of self. So if this were a cell, and these were all the different parts of the cell, the nucleus, the Golgi, the lysosome, and here's an adjacent cell, and here's the plasma membrane of the cell. So how many genes are involved in all of mammalian sialic acid biology? We went through this after the chimpanzee genome and came up with a picture like this, very complicated, lots of different genes. Uh, these are all gene names doing different things. But I can simplify all of this by saying that there's six genes involved in producing sialic acids. There are two genes involved in the activation and transport, 20 to transfer them onto things, five to modify them further, 25 to recognize them, and six to turn over and recycle them. So really, less than 70 genes are involved in sialic acid biology. And what has happened over the years is we have discovered multiple human-specific changes involving sialic acid biology. These range from every kind of gene modification you've heard about today. Gene inactivations, gene deletions, functional changes, expression changes, presence of null alleles, and so on. And so this is our published list to date, about 12 genes. And actually, the total list now is about 15. So the obvious question you may ask, are we like the drunk searching for his keys under the lamppost? Why is he looking at the lamppost? Because that's where the light is. Actually, his keys are lying somewhere over here. So uh, we are always concerned about this, and to the extent possible, we have been looking at these, the same family of genes in, or related genes in these other taxa. And I can tell you so far that while the system is rapidly evolving in many, many taxa, 
we've only found a limited number of genetic changes here. So we like to think that sialic acid-related genes are a hot spot in human evolution, one of the many places where there's been a lot of dramatic changes. So this story really began because we were many years ago looking at two major kinds of sialic acids in mammalian cells and the fact that one was missing in humans. And don't worry about the structure. One is called AC, the other is called GC, and they differ by a single oxygen atom. And basically we found what at that time was the first known genetic difference between humans and apes, that humans were missing this mutation, uh, this gene, the CMA gene, and therefore could not convert AC to GC. So we were sort of like a knockout mouse with a single gene deleted. So recently we've been trying to put together a sort of an evolutionary synthesis, if you will, of all these different findings, and re reproducing or reconstructing evolution is very difficult, in fact, practically impossible. So all you can do is make up a, a reasonable hypothesis for what might be going on. And if you imagine a common ancestor with a chimpanzee in which there was both AC and GC, uh, we went, underwent some selection. We think it was a form of malaria and uh, ended up with an excess of AC and no GC. And perhaps also in relation to influenza, we're not really sure, we also changed another gene called ST6GAL1. The bottom line is we have very different pathogen regimes related to these types of situations. So now I want to come back to uh, the other aspect, which is SIGLEX, which is the main theme here. So these are the molecules that are proteins that are recognizing sialic acid either on the same cell surface or adjacent cell surfaces. So here is a, genetic, a generic SIGLEC, a typical SIGLEC molecule. Here's the outside of the cell, the inside here's the cell membrane, extracellular Ig-like domains, intracellular signaling motifs, and here's where you recognize sialic acids. So these are found on many cell types, but often cells of bone marrow origin. As you probably know, the stem cell in the bone marrow emerges, uh, uh, develops into a variety of other cell types, which eventually develop into various cell types that end up in your blood, and then eventually some differentiate and end up in various tissues, including the brain and the, tissue, uh, and the immune system and so on. If you look at the distribution of these SIGLEX among these uh, cell types, this is a partially uh, worked out system right now, we know that the SIGLEX are expressed in various different places, and everywhere in red are human-specific changes from the great apes. So here's a closer look at the SIGLEX. There's some conserved ones, uh, four of them that are present from uh, in all, 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 at least all mammals, which I won't go into as much. We are focused on the subset called CD33-related SIGLEX, which are rapidly evolving in all taxa, particularly in humans. And so we and others have been able to clone most of these, and we think we found almost the last one in the genome. And what we found is that the inhibitory CD33-related SIGLEX are involved in recognition of self by innate immune cells. So in other words, here's a SIGLEX which has an inhibitory motif. Don't worry about the details in the cytosolic tail. But what happens is this is an immune cell. It sees sialic acid. It says, well, that's self. That's me. So it sends a negative signal and makes sure that the cell doesn't get too excited. So now, looking through these SIGLEX, we have now found human-specific changes in all of these SIGLEX. When I mean human-specific, I mean that humans are specifically different from chimpanzees who are similar to gorillas, orangutans, and so on. And so it seems unlikely that lightning would strike so many places in the same place, so we've decided to pursue this further. So trying to put this together, we have come across one finding a few years ago that many of our inhibitory SIGLEX in the chimpanzee common, or the common ancestor of humans and chimpanzees and gorillas recognize the GC sialic acid. So when we lost GC by whatever selection might have occurred, we would have ended up with a funny state where we couldn't recognize ourselves. Our immune cells could not recognize ourselves. This would not have been a good situation, probably something we were forced into. Be that as it may, if we now look at uh, the SIGLEX of humans and look at this amino terminal VSET domain that recognizes sialic acids, it's undergone rapid evolution and now binds AC. So we have gone through, we believe, a transition here, and we may be still in the middle of it. So now the further complication comes with these molecular mimicry events, these pathogens that coat themselves with sialic acid. And many pathogens express surface sialic acid, but only NU5AC, not NU5GC. So in other words, we threw away the one thing that distinguished us from all the bacteria. And, but many, many pathogens can reinvent NU5AC by multiple pathways that I won't go into. It's very easy for them to do. 
And they've done it by every way you can think of. Don't worry about the details here. Any trick you can think of to cover yourself with new 5AC, some pathogen has done it. So this must be a very powerful convergent evolution process. And interestingly, many of these are obligate human pathogens or commensals. These, these are bugs that infect only, only humans and not even chimpanzees. So what might be going on there? Well, working with Victor Nizay and some of our colleagues, uh, we go from thinking of this system of having a homeostasis where the sialic acid is being recognized and shutting off genes. Well, if you're a pathogen, that's really nice. You come in expressing sialic acid with your Klingon cloaking device and look like, look like uh, uh, the human. And in fact, that's what happens. We find that a sialic acid expressing pathogen can shut off the immune response against the kind of things that uh, you have Gillard mentioned against TLRs and so on, so we can block that. So we believe the next stage that, that happened was these new five expressing pathogens emerged, converged on humans, and hijacked our Siglex, and de developed new pathogen regimes that are specific to humans. And various other changes occurred in the, in the lymphoid system, in uh, epithelium, in the brain, so on. I'm not going to go into the details that we think are connected to these events. So now, what are you going to do if you're under attack by these Klingons with their cloaking devices? Well, you've got to retreat. And so what seems to have happened is humans have inhibited and downregulated these inhibitory Siglex. So here's a figure from some years ago where here's a human blood cells uh, collected from, during, uh, from volunteers, where there's not much Siglex uh, on the T lymphocytes, whereas chimpanzees have a lot of these, as do gorillas and, and bonobos. And so John Cohen, writing about our work here, suggested maybe human T cells have lost their breaks, and we had some evidence for this. And more recently, Paula Soto and Lance Stein have shown that, in, that he confirmed that human lymphocytes show much greater proliferative response than chimpanzees to multiple different stimuli. And so far, our only explanation so far has been reduced inhibitory Siglex, and we're working further on that. Be that as it may, we seem to have a trigger-happy immune system. And here I'm showing that from Nancy Hurtado Ziola that bonobos and gorillas are similar to chimpanzees in having a lot more Siglex. This is a, a method called flow cytometry. Okay, so now what you're going to do? These bugs are taking advantage of you. Well, uh, we always have a comeback, right? And it turns out that some, pat some Siglex we more recently discovered do the opposite. They see the same thing but give the opposite response. So you're going to come and fool me this way? I'm going to fight back with an activatory siglex. And here we have these activatory siglex. Again, don't worry about the details. This is a negative signal. This is a positive signal, basically. And so it turns out that what's happening is there are two cases we found where siglex 5 and 14 and siglex 11 and 16, where the business end of these molecules that recognize the sialic acid is kept the same by a process called, called gene conversion, in this case, concerted evolution. So these se sequences are constantly pasting themselves on top of each other. These genes are next to each other. I'm showing you here the proteins. So that the, f the front end stays the same and the back end is completely different. And these are found on the right types of cells. And 11 and 16 are particularly interesting because they're only found in the human brain, in the microglia, not in a chimpanzee brain. So what we think happened is the inhibitory siglex were downregulated, the activatory siglex were upregulated in response to this process. And, but eventually, too much of a good thing uh, is not good uh, in terms of activation. And as you probably know, too much of an activation is going to get you in trouble too. So now it turns out that several events have occurred in which humans have lost several of these siglex. So in fact, humans have deleted or partially deleted, in some cases, co completely in humans. Some cases, some of you have them, some of you don't. And we have some relationship to diseases. And we think we're still in the middle of some sort of balancing selection uh, for all these different genes, especially the ones that have changed more recently. And they range in expression patterns, not only in the uh, immune system, but in the brain, the placenta, the ovary, and all sorts of interesting places where humans have unique changes. I don't have time to go into each of these genes. But finally, I, I want to say that uh, this may relate to the fact that, as already mentioned, these apparent differences between humans and great apes in the incidence and severity of biomedical conditions. I'm not talking about diseases caused by the fact that we stand up straight. That's anatomical differences. If you're actually interested, this review just came out. We collaborated with some primate centers and updated all of these things. And you probably can't read this there, so I'll just tell you that 
This ranges from things like coronary thrombosis, the commonest cause of death in Western civilization. Uh, there's only been one great ape who's ever died of anything like that. Falciparum malaria, the big killer of humans, uh, does not really infect apes. All of the bacterial sexually transmitted diseases that, that are common in humans don't occur in apes. They get completely different diseases that I won't go into. And probable differences include hepatitis complications, Alzheimer's pathology, carcinoma, as mentioned earlier, a disease called preeclampsia that uh, is a plague for, for uh, pregnancy. And then there are some possible differences, and these are anecdotal, but the fact is uh, I've never met a veterinarian who's met or uh, seen a great ape who's had bronchial asthma or rheumatoid arthritis. And that's quite striking given uh, the frequency of these diseases. And I already mentioned is our tendency to have early, early fetal loss, which also seems to be very rare in these apes. So for what it's worth, uh, not that I'm claiming that we have found the answer to any of these, we do have a lot of hypotheses related to siglex and sialic acids that we can ask questions here. So we do have a lot of testable hypotheses. And uh, so I, in this talk, uh, as given that this is the purpose of the broad overview, I'm not talking about the specific genes. And, uh, but in many cases, we have clues that we're following up, as I said, in many tissues where unusual changes have happened in humans, including the placenta, the brain, the ovary, uh, the epithelial surfaces, and so on and so forth. So I'll leave you with the, my suggestion that sialic acid-related genes are a hot spot in human evolution. I'll tell you that we have three more genes. I'm not yet ready to talk about them that have shown human-specific changes. So it appears that the mutational load in this uh, area is uh, quite substantial. But of course, we have to keep searching here to make sure that many of these changes we find are uniquely human. But I think we've stumbled upon a system that may have been part of, uh, of uh, if, if nothing else, the scars of our evolution. Thank you.